Calling all cars. A copyrighted program transcribed and dedicated to the prevention of crime. Calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 209. Regarding a kidnapping. Suspect described as male, American. Six feet, one inch. Weight, 175 pounds. He's heavily armed and dangerous. That is all. Gordon. In order for law enforcement authorities to be efficient and one jump ahead of the law breakers, it is essential that they be equipped with and make use of all the newest scientific equipment that is applicable to the discovery of crime, the identification of the criminal, and his arrest. Unless the public is willing to and does spend the money necessary in this division of law enforcement, it will result in handicapping essential police work. Not only that, but it will give the criminal an advantage over the authorities with shattering results to society. And now... The true story of the bad man. Delacothe, Missouri. Well, Floyd, you're pretty young to be in a place like this. Never mind the Horatio Alger stuff. Young men, we don't tolerate an attitude like yours in this institution. You will obey the rules of this reform school and conduct yourself in such a manner as will make your stay here as brief as possible. I got a year to do. All right, I'll do a year. That's enough. According to your commitment, you were found guilty of petty theft and impersonating an officer. You realize that you're starting the wrong way, don't you? Do I have to stay in here? Until I finish talking to you, yes. Well, make it snappy, then. I'm not interested in preaching. All right, guard. Take him out. Come on, Floyd. All right, stop shoving. Gordon? We've got to do something about this Floyd kid. Yeah, what's he done now? Practically everything he shouldn't. This morning, he cracked another kid over the head with a plate and threw a cup at the mess hall guard while the kids were having breakfast. What's his complaint this time? Oh, who knows? He wants to be a big shot. Unless he's getting all the attention, he starts a row. Personally, I'd recommend solitary. No, no, that's against my principles. Well, principles are not. That bird's got it coming to him. Well, we get rid of him in two weeks, thank the Lord. Keep him in quarters till then. Federal Penitentiary, Leavenworth, Kansas, two years later. William Edward Floyd, age 21, served one year for petty theft and impersonation. Chillicothe, Missouri. Conduct bad. Tough guy, are you, Floyd? What do you think? I don't think so. Stick around. You'll do that. So you've been impersonating a federal officer again. So what? So you'll be with us for three years. That's your story. Look, Floyd, we might as well understand each other now. I don't take smart talk from prisoners. Oh, you don't? No, I don't can make up your mind to behave yourself while you're here. We have certain rules. They're not particularly hard, but we insist upon them being obeyed. 
Now, you can do as you please. You can obey and get along with us, or you can follow the same course you've evidently been in the habit of doing. In that case, we have our own method of dealing with you. What method? Well, if you're interested, it's easy enough to find out. Maybe I will, Warden. Hmm. Captain to you, Floyd. Okay, Captain. This is the third week in solitary for Floyd, Captain. Is he ready to be good? Well, that's a question. Personally, I don't think he ever will be what we call good. Well, how much longer has he got to go? Six months. I'll make out a transfer on him. Send him to McNeil Island. I'm tired of having him around here. That boy isn't incorrigible if I ever saw one. To say nothing of being an exhibitionist. Well, let's get him out of here. So you're Floyd. Get it off your chest. What's that? I said get it off your chest. Listen to me, young man. One thing this prison doesn't tolerate is insubordination. We have a bunch of pretty tough mugs in this place, but they stay in line or else. Or else what? Try getting out of line and you'll soon find out. Yeah, this joint ain't so tough. That remains to be seen. We're not tough if you're not. But just in case you decide to start something, let me remind you that discipline is our specialty. We're not interested in what you did before you came here. But while you're here, you do as we say. I'll give you a chance at it. We're not interested in chances or your opinion of our methods. You'll obey rules or suffer the consequences. Take him out, guard. <laughs> Send him in. In here, Floyd. Thanks, pal. I see we're getting rid of you today, Floyd. I'm getting out, if that's what you mean. I mean just what I said. We're getting rid of you. I hope you don't feel hurt, Warden. Good riddance of bad rubbish is the way I look at it. Make it double. I suppose I should ask what you're going to do now. I suppose you should, to which I would reply it's none of your business. All right, Floyd. Have it your way. Remember, though, next time we'll be three up for you. You won't come back here. No? Nope. You'll go to Alcatraz. I can take it. Well, I was hoping you'd stay out of my sight. Thanks, Warden. I needed them kind words. Your name's uh, Floyd? Yeah. And this time you're in Alcatraz. That's what it says, don't it? So you are tough, eh? Yeah. And don't start the usual line about rules and regulations. I ain't interested in how you treat prisoners. I know how long I gotta stay here and what for. So save it. Okay, Floyd. You write your own ticket. Be a good boy and we'll get along. Try any rough stuff and we'll go to town. Yeah, so I've heard. Don't worry about me, Warden. I'll do as I please. I generally do. Yes, I've heard that too. But according to your record sheet, you haven't gotten by so well. I've made out. I'll be seeing you, Warden. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. your name, buddy? Bill Floyd. The movie actor? No. Okay, pal, don't get tough about it. I'm just making conversation. Well, save it. What are you doing? The deuce. I got six weeks to go. What for? Impersonation. What's that? I was playing, pretending I was an army officer. Why? Ah, for the love of Mike, pipe down. Hey, you want to make some jack? Huh? I got a girl in Walla Walla. So What? She knows some right guys down in San Diego. Still, so what? I gotta get her south, see? Yeah. And you copy can? Sure. The torch in our mob goes to the hot seat a week from Monday. Some of the boys is gonna make a break for it. If we don't make it, you look up this dame in Walla Walla and see that she gets south. You won't lose nothing by it. Okay. Slip me your handle. You just go to the order court out on F Street and ask for Juanita. That'll find her. Well, Floyd, you didn't turn out so tough after all. From which you conclude I've learned a lesson. Uh, maybe. Maybe is right. Don't congratulate yourself, Warden. I'm just not interested in this joint. Floyd, you're breaking my heart. Take it easy, Warden. I may be back. Oh, the Lord forbid. Don't tell me I wouldn't be welcome. Floyd, if you ever come back to Alcatraz, you might just as well make up your mind to spend the rest of your life by yourself. If you ever come back here, it'll be solitary from then on. Don't worry, Copper. I won't be back. I wish I could be sure of that. Take my word for it. I won't be back.
Just outside the city of Walla Walla, a motorist gives a young man a lift. And how? Okay, get in. Yeah, nice weather we're having. Yeah. yeah. Nice for walking. Yeah. Why don't you try it? No. Uh, uh, what? Get out. Go on, get out. Oh, well, what's the idea, young fella? I thought I was doing you a favor. And, and nah, now you... you are. I said get out. Oh. When I tell him to get out, I mean for him to get out. <laughs> Sir, it sure is a nice car. Radio and everything. Have to see what we can get here. We, Paulson, are broadcast for this important announcement, which we make at the request of the local police. All officers and citizens are warned to be on the lookout for a man driving a black sedan. License number MV2026. This man held up James Smith of Walla Walla today, taking Smith's automobile after administering a severe beating to the motorist. This man is described as being six feet, two inches tall. Ha, <laughs> severe beaten. Why, I didn't hit that guy but once. Looks like this heap is hot. I guess I'll have to get a transfer. Lloyd abandoned the car, took another, which he found on the parking lot. By easy stages, he traveled south, posing now as an army officer, at other times as a G-man. Finally, in an auto court near San Isidro, Floyd ends his quest. So, uh, you're Juanita. Yeah. Who are you? Tom sent me. Where'd you see Tom? The same place where he'll be for the next ten years. Alcatraz. Shh. Let's go outside. I don't want the kids to hear us. Whose kids? Mine. Uh, we can sit in my car. It's parked back here in a shed. When'd you get in? This morning about two. I've been chasing you all the way from Walla Walla. Hmm. Nice car. Where'd you get it? I promoted it from a guy from Texas. Unfortunately, his license plates were a little conspicuous. I had to change it. Oh, hot car, eh? You might call it that. Well, what's the plan? That's for you to suggest. Tom said you knew some right guys. Plenty of them. Things are hot right now. Well, we'll make them hotter. Where are you going? Looking around. It will take a run into the city. See what we can find. You better watch yourself. These boys down here are tough. Yeah, I can take it. So I've heard. Uh, turn on that radio. It'll get police calls. I fixed it up yesterday. Uh, sort of keep track of what's going on. Hmm, don't seem to be anything coming through. Give them time. There's always a call or two going Morning, on. Car 21. Car 21. Go to your station. Morgan. Handy things, these radios. Attention I'll all say. cars to repeat on broadcast 82 regarding stolen automobile. Tan sedan. 1937 model. License in the 9 column. 9B9186. Nine, Victor. That's this nine, car. One, Shut up. Listen. Eight, six. This license not registered to this car, but stolen from another vehicle. This car being driven by man described as male American, six feet one or two inches, weight 172 pounds. Arrest car and occupants. That's all. Yeah, all right on the job, aren't they? I told you these boys are tough. Yeah, well, so am I. Let them start something. How come all you torch guys are so handy with a rod? Well, they start blasting at us, and we blast back. Hey, here comes a motor cop. Keep your trap shut. I'll do the talking if he stops. Maybe he ain't spotted us yet. Come over! What's the idea? We weren't speeding. I didn't say you were. Look, we're in a hurry. We're going to town to get some medicine for a sick kid. I only got a report on a car asking the description of this one. Come on, get out. I want to look you over. Okay, copper. Remember, copper. You asked for this. Take your hand off that hammer, you son. Oh, wait a minute. Don't shoot. Give a fellow a chance, will you? I got a wife and kids. Who cares? I won't miss this time. You didn't miss. You got my arm. It's broken now. Don't be a fool. You'll burn with this. Give a guy a break. How many man. guys did you give a break? Come on, sucker. Get in. What are you going to do? Go on. Get in. Oh, be careful. Don't kill him. Shut up. Help me get him in here. Get under the wheel. You drive. Okay. All right. Get going. Keep that radio on. How am 
much further are we going to haul this guy? Watch for a side road. We'll dump him out. There's a road right ahead there. Okay. Take it. Come on, get out, Captain. Where are we? End of the line, buddy. This is where you get off. What are you going to do to me? Stop squawking and get out. Let's get going. Hold your horses. Now listen, Copper. We're going to keep your trap shut. No, I'm not. Just as soon as I can get to a telephone, we'll be after you. You got nerve, ain't you, for a copper? I got a job to do, and as long as I can walk, I'll do it. Okay, guy, I'm a sap, but I'll let you go. Come on, Juanita. Get this hack rolling. It's too hot. We'll have to get another one. Calling all cars. Attention all cars. This may be in your district. A hold up and kidnapping on Sigsby Street between National and Newton. Motorcycle officer Hammond shot and kidnapped by a man and a woman driving a tan sedan. License in the nine column, 9B9186. Nine Victor 9186. Be on the lookout for this car and occupant. This man is dangerous. That is all. Within 20 minutes, every road leading from the county was blockaded. Not a car, truck, or dog cart traversed any known road without being stopped, searched, the driver questioned. Police, sheriff's officers, highway patrolmen, and immigration officials joined in the gigantic manhunt. Across the border, Mexican officers waited, alert and on the watch for the fleeing pair. But minutes turned into hours, and the man and the woman eluded police. Then immigration officers Farrell and Jensen, cruising along the road, spied the tan car. Hey, Farrell, there's that car we're looking for. Where? Right ahead there. See it? Yeah, I see it. Let's take it. Huh? They've seen us. Let's get going. What do you think I'm doing now, parking? They pulled into the side road. Can you make it? I can if they can. They're stopping. So are we. Hey! Hey, come back here. Let him have it. Come on over here. There's something out there in those bushes. I'm going to blast them. Oh, who's Tony? Oh, he's my boyfriend. He was drunk. I was just walking around to get him sober. Oh, yeah? In that tan car? Oh, no. We weren't in the car. We were just walking. What was Tony in such a hurry about? Oh, he has no passport, and he was afraid. I'll bet he was at that. Hey, Jensen, take a look. A woman's coat and hat, a forty-five uh-huh. empty shell, and a lot of blood on the front seat. So, you were just walking your boyfriend around, were you? Come on. You're going to jail, sister, if Hammond can identify you. <laughs> A few moments later, three officers riding along the highway near the border saw a lone man walking along the road. They hailed him. Hey, you. Come over here. What's on your mind? What are you doing out here at this time of night? I've been to see my girl. I'm on my way home. You expect us to believe that? That's your affair, friend. You can either take that or this. <laughs> But the gunman escaped again through a hail of lead from the guns of the officers. Into the river bottom of the Tijuana River sped the fugitive. Hour after hour, police from both sides of the river mingled with sheriff's deputies and immigration men scouring every foot of the rough terrain on the key vive for the desperado. As dawn broke, officers who had been on duty all night were sent home for their greatly needed rest. Other officers were sent to take their places. Relentlessly, the manhunt went on, the net growing tighter about the fleeing gunman. Sometime during the night, Floyd made contact with friends and changing clothes, Appeared next day at a home just outside Tijuana. Uh, good morning. I, uh, uh, look, do you mind if I rest a while in that shed out back of the house? Yes. I said, do you mind if I stay in that shed? ¿Qué dice, señor? No comprendo inglés. Usted no habla español, no? Huh? What the... Ah, nuts. Look, what's that place there, over there? Huh? Oh, el radio estación. XJMAO. Huh? Oh, radio station. Yeah, Please. thanks. I'll try that. Looking for someone? Huh? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, I was looking for Juan Matenis, you know him? No, what does he do? Do? I, I don't know. He's supposed to work here. No, I'm afraid you have the wrong place. We don't know him here. Yeah. I guess so. Maybe it's some other place. Uh, did you try Nelson's warehouse over there, on the other corner? Maybe he works there. Yeah, yeah maybe so. I'll try that. So long. See ya. That is funny. I wonder what I've seen that place before. Oh, well, Kinshavi, 
I have programs to run. What do you want in here? I want to stay here a while. Well, I'm the watchman here, and I can't let you hang around here. That's what you think. I'll hang around here as long as I want to. Well, see, wait a minute. Are you Floyd, that guy that shot Hammond over in San Diego? So what? I know you now. I saw your picture in the paper this morning. Listen, you. You better keep your trap shut up. You want to live and do well. No, sir. You can't scare me. I'm going to call the police. Yeah? Make another crack like that and I'll let you have it. You'll have to catch me first. Come back here, you fool. <laughs> there, that sap. You'll have every cop in Mexico around here. Well, uh, I'll barricade this joint and stick it out. If I can stay here till dark, I can make a break for it. <laughs> Right in there, senor. He's in the warehouse there. All right, men. Spread out. Get to places where you can see without being seen. Let's blast him out. All right, Floyd. Come on out. Come and get me, chopper. All right, men. Let him have it. Hold your fire, men. Are you ready to surrender, Floyd? No! Oh, gee. Will it be all right if I broadcast this? What do you mean, broadcasting? Look, we've run a microphone line out from the transmitter over there. We'd like to broadcast the report of the fight. Oh, go ahead. Why don't you get the police department to sponsor it? Salvador. Si, senor. See if you can get a mirror shot from uh, behind that packing box over there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most thrilling broadcasts we have been able to bring you from these stations. Chief Cardi of the Tijuana Police is having one of his men make a shot using a mirror to sight him. The officer is taking aim while remaining concealed by the big box. Look. Looks like he's, he's ready to shoot. Yes, he's about to make it. Oh, boy. That Floyd must be a crack shot. He broke that mirror the officer was using. All right, me. Chief Cardi is changing his plan of battle. Take your fire. We will try to catch his instructions to his men. Turn it off. Take your fire. One. Get a ladder. That one over by the building there. Try to par, pry a part of that roof off. Salvador. Si, senor. Uh, get your rifle out of the car. Climb up on that roof next to the building. See if you can get a shot at him from there. Si, senor. Pronto. All right, men. Start firing. The crowd is growing every minute. There must be at least three or four thousand people here. Emigration officials from across the river have been trying to get Chief Cardi to let them join in the fight. But, as you know, it is against the law for officers from other countries to bring arms into Mexico. Chief Sears from San Diego is out here. And there's Captain Kelly of the San Diego police. He brought over a bunch of gas shells and some gas bombs. Ah, Chief Cardi is getting ready to shoot the gas into the warehouse. We doubt it will do much good, though, because the front of the warehouse, that is, the gable part, is open. The building is being repaired and enlarged. Ah, there they go. They're firing gas into the building. Lloyd seems to be escaping most of the gas. Does not look as though it went far enough back into the building. After all, Chief Carty is taking a pretty big chance of getting hit by one of Floyd's bullets. Floyd is keeping up a pretty steady fire from the warehouse. He seems to be using at least two guns. Oh, here comes Jensen, an immigration officer who arrested Floyd's woman companion last night. Looks like he's going to confer with Chief Carty. Maybe we can pick it up. We'll crank up the gain a little and see. Chief! Chief! Let me see if I can get this mug to surrender. All right, go ahead. Hey, Floyd! What do you want, cop? Come on out! You can't get away with this. You'll have a lot worse time squaring this beef if you don't surrender now. Oh, yeah? You want me to come out and let you beat me up and send me back to Alcatraz, do you? Not to you! Here's a present for you! Uh, he's all yours, Chief. Salvador, bring that machine gun. Grand, the senor. We've been trying to protect the merchandise in that building. Now we must get the prisoner. Ready, senor. Fire! Floyd, are you ready to surrender? No! One, throw the gas bomb. Please, go! One or take us. Just throw a gas bomb into the warehouse. You can see the gas oozing out the nail holes in the roof of the building. It's inconceivable how much gas Floyd can stand. Officer says there's enough gas in there to smoke out a dozen men. Floyd! Wait a minute. Chief Carter is calling to Floyd again. Floyd, I'm asking you again to surrender. There will be no violence done you. See, I'm laying down my own gun. I'm going to walk to the door. If you shoot me, 
you will be killed by my men. If you surrender, you will be treated fairly. Chief Cardi has laid down his gun. He's walking up to the door. Floyd has stopped shooting. Everyone is tense, waiting to see if the desperado will shoot Chief Cardi. What a chance to take. I tell you, it takes nerve to do what the chief is doing. He's reached the door. All right, Floyd. He is standing there. He's speaking to Floyd again. Come out, Floyd. All right, I'm coming out. There's Floyd. He's come out of the building. He's shaking hands with Chief Cardi. He surrendered. <laughs> In just a moment, you will hear the summation of our story. no question that it was the gas bombs which routed out the young madman, an example of the application of scientific methods in the apprehension of criminals, resulted in the surrender of the criminal without further sacrifice of human life. Floyd was confined in a Mexican prison. He escaped and was reapprehended by United States authorities and is now serving a sentence in the federal prison. No, crime does not pay. cars, attention all cars, cancellation broadcast 209. Suspect in this case now in custody. That is all. Gordon. Copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 210 regarding an escaped prisoner. Suspect described as a male American, 5 feet 11 inches. Weight about 170 pounds. This man escaped from an officer while en route to Los Angeles. 
is thought to be hiding in the Tehachapi Mountains. This man is dangerous. That's all. Rosenquist. I know you will all agree that a shop foreman who does not give his men the right kind of tools to work with has no right to complain if they turn out faulty, imperfect work. Likewise, you are the boss of your car, and if you provide it with an inferior or average gasoline, you have no one to blame for an inefficient motor but yourself. But power it with Rio Grande cracked gasoline, and you have every right to expect, and you will get the same faster getaway, steadier purring acceleration, longer mileage, greater reserve power, and maximum speed which the drivers of police cars and other emergency equipment get by always filling up with Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Because they demand all of these essential qualities, the officials of 30 leading cities and counties specify Rio Grande cracked as the gasoline used exclusively to power their emergency public service car. Be a good boss. Give your car the best gasoline there is to work with. Drop in at the red and white station of your friendly Rio Grande dealer tomorrow morning and give your car the means of delivering police car performance by taking aboard a tank full of Rio Grande crack, the most highly recommended gasoline in the West. Tonight, we again take pleasure in presenting Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. There seems to be a general, though erroneous, idea that so-called society crooks are of the higher type of criminal. This is not true. It is, of course, a foregone conclusion that any person is going to fail at any game outside the law. He may get by for months or even years, but eventually he is going to wind up behind bars. That is certain. But there are not many criminals who will admit this. Fully 50% of the society crook's intake goes for transportation and hotel bills. He must keep on the move continuously. Then there are the usual rounds of the nightclubs and parties, for the crook must pose as a big shot. Show me a man who has spent a lifetime outside the law, and I'll show you a man who will die a pauper. I am not moralizing in making this statement. It is a fact. The story which you will hear tonight definitely shows that crime does not pay. In a hotel in downtown Los Angeles, a man and a woman are dancing. Yeah, you're a pretty good dancer. Where'd you learn? Oh, I've been around. You're not so bad yourself. Thanks. You live here in a hotel? Mm-hmm. You've been here long? Oh, about a week. You know many people? Not many. Where are you from? Denver. Are you married? <laughs> at present. What do you mean, at present? Well, I'm thinking of not going back. I see. You like a drink? Oh, I, I don't mind. Should we go up to my room? Well, I... Oh, I see. Old-fashioned girl. No, I'm not. Okay, forget it. I'll prove I'm not old-fashioned. Let's go up to my room. Well, that's the spirit. Let's go. I always have trouble getting this key in. Let me try it. Oh, there you are. Oh, thanks. Now for our little drink. Right here. I always have a full flask with me. Oh, uh, I'll call for some ice and seltzer water. Okay. Hey, is this a picture of your husband? Over there? Oh, yes. Um, room service, please. Will you send up some ice and seltzer to 309? Hey, he's not a bad-looking hombre. <laughs> he's got a disposition like a bear. I don't see how he could have with you around. Maybe. <laughs> but I'm not around. Well, that's my good luck. Think so? Sure I do. Come here. Hey, wait a minute. Well, you're a fast worker, aren't you? Why oh, waste valuable time? Hey, take it easy, big boy. I, well, I don't even know your name yet. 
Is that necessary? Well, I might get tired of saying, hey, you. You won't have to call me. I won't be far. <laughs> sure of yourself, aren't you? I have to be. Oh, um, yes? Room service. Just a minute. You're all right. He won't notice anything. You surely can muss a person up. Oh, that will be all. Thanks. Well, I, I said that will be all. Yes, ma'am. Hey, what's the matter with that boy? How should I know? Come on, let's drink. Say when. Uh, 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 when? Miss Seltzer? Well, here you are. Here's to us. To us. Come on, sit down. Here. Oh, gee. Not so tight. Can't take it, huh? We'll see. It's a nice ring you're wearing. Oh, engagement. Good looking watch. Yeah, anniversary. What to set the old man back a pretty penny. Oh, he can stand it. He's got plenty. You love him? Mm, a little. Love me? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Let's have another drink. Okay. Enough? Okay. Well, here's to you. To you. Mm, now we're getting somewhere. <gasps> Sleepy? Uh, liquor always does that to me. You know what to do about that, don't you? Sure. Good night. Good night? Yes. Good night. Oh, good night. It's 9 o'clock. So what? You left a call for 9 o'clock. Oh, did I? Oh, well, all right. Thanks. <gasps> What's wrong? Oh, my watch. My ring. I've been robbed. Oh, call the police. <laughs> A few nights later, in another hotel in the downtown district. Oh, oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't see you standing there. Oh, that's all right. I should have been watching more carefully. Do you always watch carefully? Well, I don't believe I understand you. Well, that's my misfortune. Say, do you mind if I join you in your walk? You see, I'm a stranger here, and, well, you know how it is. Yes, uh, I do. However, I'm not taking a walk. I was just going to have a cocktail before I went to my room. Well, so was I. Will you allow me? I shouldn't, but I will. Well, thank you. I think the hotel has a bar. Well, don't you stop here? Well, yes, I, I just registered. I have a room on the 8th floor. How odd. My room's on the 8th, too. Well, we'll have to get better acquainted. Yes, we will. Well, here we are. Yes, sir. What's for you? What'll it be? Old-fashioned. Make mine the same. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, that's a beautiful ring you have on. Engagement? Yes. Recently? Uh-huh. You sound rather happy about it. I am. That's swell. I haven't been so lucky along that line. Well, here you are. Thank you, sir. That's right. Well, cheer up. You're young yet. Maybe I can make something out of that. Skull. Salute. <sighs> well, shall we go up now? Yeah, think we shall. You know, I've been losing too much sleep lately. You better watch yourself. You'll be losing that boy's figure. Yeah, Probably get circles under my eyes. <laughs> Up. Eight, please. Eight. Nice weather we're having. Now, that has all the earmarks of a bored young woman's way of closing a conversation. Nothing of the sort. I do think the weather's nice. Well, maybe it is at that. I haven't noticed. Have you lived here long? Why, no. As a matter of fact, I just came to town. Oh, then I'll probably see you around occasionally. Very probably, if you let me be seen. I'll consider it. Eight, please. My room's right around the corner. Well, good night. Oh, I'll see you safely tucked in. Tucked in? Well, uh, at least inside the door. <laughs> That's better. Get inside. What's the meaning of this? Pipe down. Give me that sparkler. What? Well, 
I'll do nothing of the sort. Oh, yes, you will. Oh. Get over there, you little tramp. Now, give me that ring. You keep away from me. Well, I'll just take this watch first. Now that ring. Ah. Shut up, you little fool. You want everybody in the joint up here? Yes. Help, help, help. Uh, you asked for it, sister. Hey, let go there. Oh, you're trying to tear my coat. <laughs> <laughs> Hours later, the bruised and battered girl recovered consciousness. Sobbing with hysteria, she dragged her way to the telephone, summoned the hotel manager. That horrified official called the police, and Detective J.E. Morris of the robbery squad, working alone, responded to the call. No, 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 Miss Martin, now try to calm yourself and tell me what happened. Well, I, I met this man downstairs. Yeah? I was coming around the corner in the lobby, and he bumped into me. I didn't think anything of it at the time. Well, probably deliberate. Then we went in and had a drink in the bar, and he said he lived on this floor. Uh, had you mentioned your floor before he said that? Well, no, I don't think I did. Uh, then what did he do? Well, we came up in the elevator together, and he said something about tucking me in. Make any other proposition? No, uh, I resented his attitude a little. He seemed to sense it. Then I unlocked the door. When I did, he opened the door and shoved me into the room. I said something to him, and he struck me. Then he asked me for my ring. Did you give it to him? No, but he, he caught hold of my wrist and jerked my watch off. Then he pulled the ring off. I screamed for help, and he, he started beating me. Mm, he tore your finger up quite a bit, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. You better get to a doctor and have that fixed up. Now then, Miss Martin, can you give me a description of this man? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, I just thought of something. Yeah, what's that? Well, when he hit me the first time, I, I sort of fell to one side, and I grabbed his, his coat pocket, the breast pocket. It had a card in it, and when I tore the pocket, I held on to the card. He grabbed part of it away from me, but, but here's the other piece. May I see that a moment? Uh, F-E-R. Evidently the last part of a name. Have any idea what this man's name was? No, I never saw him before. F-E-R. That might be anything from a firm name to, a, to an ash can. F-E-R. I want my ring back. I don't care about anything else. I just want the ring back. Back at headquarters, Morris begins the interminable task of trying to find a man whose surname ends with the letters F-E-R. Hour after weary hour, he pours over record cards of arrests in similar cases, always hoping against hope that he'll find a name ending in F-E-R. Banker, Battler, Bauer, Baxter... Falcon, Fagan, Farset, Faversham, Fawcett. Lincoln, Long Green, Long Necker, Lugger. Sanders, Sanderson, Sigurd, Shaddock, Schaefer. Schaefer, Schaefer, F-E-R, S-H-A-F, F-E-R, Schaefer. That's it, Schaefer. Charles B., 5 feet 11, weight 170, blonde hair, blue eyes, suspicion of robbery. 1926, 1927. That's my man. Same method of operation, same description. Okay, Mr. Schaefer, I'll be seeing you. The address given on the record card of the suspect, Charles Schaefer, Speed's Detective Morris. Yeah, want to see somebody, mister? Uh, yeah, I'm Officer Morris, a police robbery detail. I'm looking for a chap named Schaefer. He lives here, I believe. Nope, you're wrong. He used to live here. What do you mean he used to? Well, he moved out this morning. Know where he moved to? Nope, none of my business. Mind if I look over his room? Nope, won't do no good, though. Cleaned it up this morning after he left. Least ways my wife did. Uh, I'd like to look it over if you don't mind. All right, come along. Right in here. Okay. Oh, why the hurry to clean the place up? Well, I want to rent it again. Won't find nothing in there. Clean it out. And so I see. Anything in the closet? Nope. You might as well look, though. Uh, no luck here. <laughs> what are you looking at the telephone for? There's numbers written on the wall. Ain't none there. I rubbed them out with an eraser. <laughs> You're a thorough guy, aren't you? Sure. I'd like to have the place ready for a new rumor. You know anything about this fellow Schaefer? Nope. Never paid no attention to him. He just come in, went out when he got ready. You know anybody he ran around with? Nope. He kept his rent paid up, huh? Yep. Seemed to have plenty of money? 
All he needed. You know anything about his girlfriend? Nope. Never did see none. Well, you know anything about any phone calls he got or any he made? Well, some gal called him up once or twice. Don't know nothing about her, though. Mm-hmm. You mind if I just stick around in here a while and see what I can find? Nope. Help yourself. <laughs> Although Morris went over every inch of closet and places about the room where a clue might be hidden, the officer found nothing. Still in his mind, there lingered the thought that somewhere in that room was a clue, something important that he had overlooked. Day after day, he returned to the house, but each time his search of the room was fruitless. Then one day, almost a week after his first search, he made a final trip to the room. I'm sorry to trouble you again, but I'd like to look that room over again. All right. I still think you're crazy, though. <laughs> Maybe, sir. I got a hunch I've overlooked something in that room. All right. Come on in. Look at it till you're blind if you want to. You know, what I like about you is your spirit of cooperation. Yep, I thought so. <laughs> well, why don't you start looking? Well, don't worry about me. Just go on about your work. I'll just sit here a few minutes. Crazy as a bedbug. It's gone completely. <laughs> thing doesn't make sense. There's bound to be something other than this. No bird ever pulled a set of deals like this without leaving you sometime. Wonder what I've missed. And yeah, there's bound to be a woman in this somewhere, too. Yeah, what's that? A piece of paper sticking out of the baseboard. <laughs> Just a piece of paper. I'll take a look at this thing. Ah, a piece of envelope. Huh? Oh, some numbers. Nine four five. Six nine four five. I've got it. That's a telephone number. I've got Mr. Schaefer right where I want him. Back to headquarters rushed Detective Morris, his brain afire with plans for the capture. Hurriedly he began calling the number six nine four five. Using every possible Los Angeles exchange. Six, nine, four, five. Hello? Uh, Mr. Schaefer there? Mr. Schaefer. Uh, never mind. Six, nine, four, five. Hello? Oh, hello. Uh, Charlie Schaefer there. Okay. Oh, hello. Uh, I want Charlie Schaefer. You got the wrong number, buddy. Try some other joint. Oh, nuts. Six. Thus, weary hour after hour, modest dials, telephone numbers, all to no avail. Schaefer is not known in Los Angeles. Then, in desperation, Morris takes the number and goes to the office of Special Investigator Claude Peterson of the telephone company. Hey, Claude, I've got a number here. I know it's a phone number. I've tried every exchange in Los Angeles. Now I want to check your long-distance calls and see if we can find out where that number is. You haven't by any chance lost your mind, have you? <laughs> I don't know. I'm beginning to wonder. Just the same, I want to check those calls. How far back do you want to go? Six months, if necessary. Okay. Let's get out of the fire room and get at it. Look, boss. I'm willing to go through a lot for the police department, but this is too much. Oh, come on now. Let's look at just a few more cards. Look as long as you want to. I'm quitting. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. What now? Take a look at that. Well, I'm a dirty name. 6945, Medford, Oregon. 2270, Oregon Place. Well, can you tie that? I think I can. Right to the coattail of Charlie Schaefer. <laughs> Chief of Police... Medford, Oregon. Please go to 2270 Oregon Place and arrest and hold Charles B. Schaefer. This man's wanted for robbery by the Los Angeles police. Notify Morris, robbery detail. Forty-five minutes later. Morris, robbery, LAPD. Have Charles Schaefer in custody. Found him at the address given by you. Advise disposition. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
North to Medford sped Officer Morris, armed with writs of extradition for Charles B. Schaefer. In Medford, however, he meets with delay. Then one day at the railway station in Medford. I tell you, Morris, you're foolish to try to make this trip as ill as you are. No, no I've been here three weeks, son. I've got to get this bird back for trial. But what if something happens to you? You won't be able to defend yourself or do anything if you decided to get tough. I'll keep an eye on him. Yes, but you've already spent two days in the hospital. You're not well enough to be up now. Oh, it's okay. The doctor gave me a prescription to take with me. I'll be all right. Okay, have it your own way. Well, Chief, I'll be seeing you sometime. So long, Morris. Let me know if you need any help. Down through the Oregon countryside sped the train bearing Morris and his prisoner. Mile after mile, flying like fugitive shadows past the compartment windows. Then, back in Medford, a frantic telephone shouts an alarm in the home of the chief of police. Yes? Hey, chief, I, I hit the body at home, but I don't know what else to do. What's all the excitement? Well, uh, you know that Los Angeles officer? Morris? Uh, yes, sir. Well, I filled a prescription for him early this morning, and I've just discovered that I gave him a powerful sleeping drug instead of what the prescription called for. Good Lord, man. Do you realize what this might mean? Uh, uh, yes, yes, sir. That's why I, I called you. Well, stay where you are. I'll be right down. Back on the train, Officer Morris, having taken the tablets according to the doctor's instructions, lies sleeping in his berth. Above, handcuffed and manacled to the sleeping officer below, a restless prisoner tosses in his bed. Stealthily, silently, he removes from a small thrust a pair of flat-nosed pliers. Carefully, he places them in the double side of the peerless handcuff and twists hard against the case-hardened steel. Bit by bit, grinding his teeth with pain as the metal cuts into his flesh. Schaefer cries at the cuff. Little by little, he loosens the rivets that hold him prisoner. At last, his hands are free. Cautiously, he pries the shackle about his ankle. It is loose. Tearing at the flesh of the ankle, the chain is forced down and off. Then, as the pale fingers of dawn push back the curtain of snow-blanketed night, the train labors up to the hatch to be grade. Dropping silently to the corridor, Schaefer makes his way to the vestibule, opens the trap door leading to the steps, and lets himself off into the snow. The summit reached, the train begins its downward flight as the fugitive takes stock of his surroundings. Our scene shifts now to the office of the sheriff of Kern County. Highway Patrolman William Snare reports for duty. Hi, Reynolds. Anything doing? Mm, no, no, not much. Prisoner got away from a Los Angeles officer going up to the Hatchapi grade. Hey, the boys over in Mojave found one of our stolen cars. That's about all. Mm, well, let's take a run over to Mojave and pick up the car. Yeah. Got a description of the prisoner? Yep, right here. Hmm. His record looks like a tough customer, doesn't he? They're all alike to me. Yeah, get me scared and I'll outshoot any of them. Well, better get started. Looks like it's liable to snow again today. Keep your eyes peeled for any stray cars. We've had a lot of them stolen lately. Yeah, regular epidemic. Hey, there's a Chevy... Right up the road there a piece. Yeah, get the license number. We'll yeah. check on it on our way back. Okay. That's probably the one we're looking for. Hey, Joe. Hmm? Take a look at that fellow up the road there. Yeah. We better ask him a few questions. Come over here a minute, fella. Yeah? What is it? What are you doing out here at this time of the morning? Why, I'm a, I'm a milkman. I held up a little while ago. Some guys took my car and beat it. Oh, Yeah. Well, get in. We'll see if we can find them on our way over to Mojave. You can get in the middle. Okay. Where are you from? I work out of Clear Creek. Clear Creek, huh? Yeah. Well, we'll get a report on your holdup when we get over to the Hatchapi. into the telephone office here. I don't like his looks. Sure. Let's keep our eyes on him. Yeah. Hey, you, come on in. Me? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, Captain Snare. What brings you to Tehachapi so early? Oh, I'm looking for stolen cars and suspects. Get me ranking in the sheriff's office in Bakersfield, will you? Right away, Captain. 
I got the license number of that stolen car, Joe. Yeah, right here. I'll check on that. Say, how about the escaped prisoner's description? I left it in my book. It's in the car. I'll get it. Never mind. Huh? Stay here. Yeah. I'll get it from Rankin. Here's your car, Captain. Take it in the first booth there. Okay. Hello, Rankin. Say, give me a description of that prisoner that got away from Morris. Yeah? Yeah? 511. Yeah. Well, I think we got him. Say, what are you trying to do? What do you think you're taking me back for? Say, don't get tough, young fella. We're taking you back whether you like it or not. Oh, you think so, do you? Hey, yeah, give me that guy. guy up on the road. Oh, yes, I do. Honey, I like this. Look, my hobby. Well, he's got There's my just... gun. <laughs> Put that gun down. That's the you, copper. Oh. You got him, Bill. Hello, Rankin. Say, never mind the description. Notify Morris that we got his man. And send out the coroner. motorist's best friend or worst enemy is his gasoline. Some brands are what you might call fair-weather friends, but Rio Grande Cracked is the kind of friend that never lets you down, no matter how hard the going or how severe the demands of unforeseen emergencies. Regardless of weather conditions, Rio Grande Cracked gives your motor the maximum performance of which it is capable. The drivers of your emergency public-serving cars discovered that fact by testing all brands of motor fuel. Then they rolled up 55 million miles of the hardest, fastest kind of driving over California highways using Rio Grande Cracked exclusively. If you want that kind of a friend, giving your motor more efficient operation and saving you money in the bargain, let the man at the red and white Rio Grande station introduce you. Drive in tomorrow morning. Fill up with Rio Grande Cracked gasoline. Don't envy the police car performance of your neighbor's car. Get police car efficiency in your own with Rio Grande Cracked. The favorite gasoline of those who drive the most and those who think the most of their car. And now again, we hear Chief Davis. The desperation of the man Schaeffer and his determination to escape punishment for his crime caused him to pay the supreme penalty for his deeds. No stigma attached to either Detective Morris, who lost the fugitive, or to Officer Reynolds, whose gun Schaeffer snatched in his effort to gain freedom. In Morris' case... The suddenness of the attack rendered him helpless to defend himself. At all events, Schaefer's crime failed to pay. Thank you, Chief Davis. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. A cancellation of broadcast 210 regarding an escaped prisoner. This man shot by highway patrolman snare while resisting arrest. That's all. Rolls and quiz. Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. Calling all cars, a copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. San Bernardino Sheriff's Office calling all cars. San Bernardino Sheriff's car to broadcast 211 regarding a dead body in the desert near Langsford Well. That's all. Rolls and quit. Officers of the law conduct many a secret investigation, but it is no secret as to what takes them there and brings them back with maximum speed, safety, and economy. Everyone on the Pacific Coast knows by this time that it is Rio Grande cracked gasoline that spins the wheels of more police cars, ambulances, fire engines, 
and other public service cars wherever it is sold than any other brand. Yes, most of the drivers of emergency cars use Rio Grande Cracks exclusively, but they are not the only ones. Countless thousands of motorists also have discovered that this really superior gasoline starts more quickly, delivers smoother acceleration and more miles with greater reserve power and speed. You needn't envy your neighbor. If you want police car performance for your car, follow that neighbor into the nearest red and white Rio Grande station tomorrow morning and get it. Take on a tank full of Rio Grande cracks, and you will understand why this finer motor fuel is the most highly recommended gasoline in the West. For fuller measure, more complete motoring pleasure, get Rio Grande Crack gasoline. pleasure to present a message from the Sheriff of San Bernardino County, Emmett L. Shea. Thank you, Dr. Lindsway. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today, throughout all the far-flung territory that comprises California, there is not a single outpost of the law where out-of-date police methods are involved. Today, the San Bernardino Sheriff's Office, of which I have the honor to be the head, is in common with every other law enforcement office in the state, equipped and alert to meet the best of the worst in criminal elements. Crimes today are, of course, the same as they were years ago. Murder is still murder. But no longer does the sheriff gallop forth at the head of a posse to track his man through the trackless desert, but scientific methods are employed to bring the criminal to justice. Perseverance, patience, and intelligent deduction, coupled with expert analysis, contributed to the solution of the case we are about to hear. Hey, Sheriff, this is Jim Lucas, out of Daggett. Oh, yes, Jim. Hi. Fine. Uh, say, Walter, a couple of kids riding on top of an old prospector's wagon came through here a little while ago and said they saw a man lying back of some mesquite bushes out close to Langford's well. Well, that's about 25 miles northeast of where you are now, isn't it? That's right. When did they make this find? Just a few hours ago. Shot? No, clubbed. Uh, when? Hard to say exactly. Must be quite a spell back, though, maybe a month. Had any rains up there? No, not for a couple of months. No dust storms either. Well, that's good. You left the body there, of course. Right where it was found. Fine. I'll round up some of the boys and be right out. Oh, and Jim, you'd better meet us at Daggett so you can show us where the body is. All right, Walter. I'll be ready for you. Across the vast expanse of a county that is almost half the size of the entire state of New York... Sheriff Shea piloted his men. Northward, over historic El Cajon Pass, over which early-day Mormons had driven ox carts into the fertile San Bernardino Valley, past picturesque Victorville sleeping beside the meandering Mojave, and out into a dusty road that leads to Langford's well. Right over there, behind that second clump of bushes. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. You see those two furrows? Looks like the man was killed here on the road and dragged over there. Yeah. Guess his heels made those marks. Uh, here's a big patch of blood. Looks like the killer rested a while here. Must have been a fairly small man. Uh, how do you know? Well, I looked at the body this morning, and the fellow wasn't very big himself. Well, anyway, we know that two men could have carried the body. Must have been just one man in on the job. That's what I figured. Oh, uh, is this the body? Yeah. What there is left of it. Ah, no dental work that'll furnish any clues. Figure he'd weigh about 135 pounds, wouldn't you, Jim? Just about. Oh, hey, Emmett. Yeah? Have Butteroff bring his camera over here. And the rest of you boys can be looking the ground over. Make a circle out about 100 yards and don't miss anything. All right, Dad. Oh, Jim, you better write down a list of these clothes and things. I'll call them off to you. All right, go ahead. Blue serge suit. Suit. Knitted sweater. Wait a minute. I got it. White shirt, no collar. No collar. No tie. 
Brown right. socks, tan shoes. All right. Any labels in the clothes? No, not a one. Say, Dad, I checked up all around here. Apparently the man was killed in a car and then dragged over here. There's no blood where the heel tracks begin. Find anything in the pocket? No, not a thing. Well, here, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's something down in the corner of the watch pocket. There. Huh. Well, a piece of note paper looks like. There's some printing on the other side. Yeah, it looks like a sheet off of a memo pad. Yes, sir, that's just what it is. Came from the Security State Bank, Ogden, Utah. Well, it looks like there are some notes and some figures on here, too. I can't make them out, though. How about you, Emmett? Well, let me see. No, I can't do it, Dad. Guess we'd better take it back and look at it under a good magnifying glass. Yep, I guess that's the best. Well, let's get busy and bury this fellow. Don't want to take any more chances on losing any other identification there might be here. <laughs> Realizing that with the month's headway, the chances of escape for the criminal were 1,000 to 1, Sheriff Shea and his men set to work to establish the identity of the victim and to tie to the slender thread of a clue the train of circumstances of his death. What have you found on that paper, Emmett? Well, besides a lot of figures I can't read, there seems to be a complete set right there on the back. Let's see. Hmm. 87, 79. Well, that might mean anything. That's right. But since this is a bank memo, I'd figure they meant that much money. Mm, that's a natural assumption. Yeah, but that doesn't bring us any nearer solution of the case than we were before. Mm, I'm not so sure about that. What do you mean? I'm going up to Ogden and see what I can find out from the Security State Bank. <laughs> you think they'll be able to recognize this memo sheet? Well, maybe not, but then again, they might. It's a chance. But this is the only clue we have. We might as well work on it. I know I'm not going to pass it up. Well, I wish you luck, Dad. Thanks, son. And keep an eye on things while I'm gone. <laughs> Morning. May I help you? Well, yes. I'm looking for the president of this bank. Why, he's not here right now, going to lunch. Probably won't be back for two hours or so. Maybe I could help you. Well, maybe. I'm uh, Walter Shea, sheriff of San Bernardino County down in California. Well, how do you do, sheriff? I'm George Dye, cashier of the bank. Well, maybe you can help me with that. You see, we had a little killing down in our neck of the woods some time back. Found out about it just after Christmas. Well, we haven't got hiding or hairs of a clue as to who committed the murder. The only thing we found was this little piece of paper. Now, where did I put that? Oh, yes, here it is. You ever see a piece of paper like that? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, of course. That's one of our memos. We keep them right here on the counter for the customers to use. I see. Yep, the same kind, all right. Well, that means our man was here recently, doesn't it? Yeah, I imagine it does. We got the last shipment of these pads about June. That was the first time that we'd used this particular kind. There's a set of figures on the back, right here. 87, 79. Now, I know it's asking a lot, but is there a possibility that those figures mean anything to you? Uh, let me see. Uh, well, I, I don't know about the other writing, but Mr. Stevens, the bank president, evidently wrote those figures down for one of the customers. And I've got to know which customer. Those figures look familiar. Uh, let me think. No, no, that wouldn't be the one. Let's see. I, George, I do remember something about that. Seems to me I remember a transaction involving that amount. Uh, it was right around a holiday. Now, let me think. Let's see, there was Christmas. Before that was Thanksgiving. Then back Friday was Armistice Day. Yeah, that's it. Right around the early part of November. Uh, do you remember who the customer was? Well, he wasn't exactly a customer. You see, this man came in and Mr. Stevens took care of him. As I recall it, he had a bank account back east somewhere, and, well, he wanted to transfer his funds out here. He was just passing through here, said he'd become stranded. It was a telegraphic transfer, if I remember rightly. Do you happen to remember the name? No, not offhand, but I could check up on it. I'll tell you what it will do. We'll call the telegraph office and ask them to go through their files of a couple of months ago, and maybe we can get a double check on it. <laughs> State Bank, Dye speaking. This is Western Union. We found a couple of messages about transferring funds to your bank. One was sent on November 10th. Have you got it there? Yes. Shall I read it? If you will, please. It says, Telegraph Security State Bank, Ogden, Utah, balance of my account. It's signed Wilfred Hay. Hey, is that the name? Yes. The wire went to the People's State Bank, Detroit, Michigan. We have a copy of the reply on that. It says, Cannot 
transfer of funds without passbook. Anything else? Yes. Here's another wire signed with the same man, Wilfred Hay. It says, Bank at Rock Springs, Wyoming, is sending passbook. Wave identification. By all means, get money to me at once. It must have been in a hurry. All right, thanks a lot. Well, there's your man's name, Wilfred Hay. Let's see, we should have a receipt for the money in this file right here. Harris, Harrison, Harvey, Hemp, Hay. Here it is. Wilfred Hay. Received a security state bank, Ogden, Utah, $87.79 in telegraphic transfer of funds at request of People's State Bank, Detroit, Michigan. Mm Mm-hmm. Happen to remember what this fellow looked like? Well, yes. Uh, You see, this business was a little out of the ordinary, and I noticed the man rather closely. He had reddish-brown hair, as I recall. Uh, Must have weighed around, oh, 130 or 140. Rather slight. Had long, tapering fingers. Seemed rather refined. Had on a blue serge suit, I believe. Say what his business was? Yes, I I believe he said he was a printer, going west to look for a job. Mm, That sounds like the man we found, all right. Do you remember if he was alone? No, I don't think so. It seems there was another fellow with him. I didn't have any conversation or any dealings with him, though, so, well, I didn't pay particular attention to him. Seems like he was smooth-shaven, seemed sort of quiet and reserved. I noticed that he did pay pretty close attention when Hay mentioned some British war bonds he owned. You don't happen to know where Hay lived while he was here, do you? Well, he gave us the address of the Grand Hotel. Now, you might talk to Sheriff Pennock. He might have a line on him. Well, thanks, Mr. Dyer. Sheriff, I'm Walter Shea from San Bernardino, California. I'm checking up on a couple of boys that came through here about the first of last month. A fellow named Hay and another fellow named Watts. Uh, let me see. I got a list of most of the people who come in contact with in the past few weeks. Uh, let's see. Uh-huh. Yep, yep, here it is. Hey, young fella. About 30. Right complexion. That's the one. Watts was with him. They told me the car was broken down. Headed out at Roden's Garage in Washington Avenue. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? I'm Sheriff Shea. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sheriff Pinnock phoned me you were coming out. Yes. I'm checking up on a chap named Hay and another named Watts. Remember him? Yeah. Besides, my book will show the job I did for him. I looked him up after Pinnock phoned me. Here's the entry right here. Hmm. November 9th, J.H. Watts. Oh, I see you lent him $5 on the car. Yeah, he said he needed the money to buy food for wife and baby. Here's a guess. Hmm. Don't have any record of a woman in this case. He wanted 25 bucks. Said he'd get it next day from Wyoming. I let him have five and stuck it on the bill. Well, what kind of car was it? Small Oakland touring car. Watts had a bill of sale to it. He'd come in again in a day or two and picked it up. Recall how this man Watts looked? Well, uh, I'd say he was five, nine, or ten inches tall. Guess he weighed around 160, 165 pounds, maybe a little more. A uh, smooth shaven? Yeah, I believe he was. Light or dark? Dark. Straight black hair. Athletic build or slight? Mm, decided athletic. Think I'll start looking for that young man. <laughs> Sheriff Shea returned to his office in San Bernardino and immediately contacted Captain of Detectives Edward Fox of Detroit, asking his assistance in tracing the movements of Hay and Watts. Fox chose as his starting point the People's State Bank in Detroit. Uh, I've got a letter here from the Sheriff of San Bernardino County out in California, asking for some information on a man who used to do business with his bank. Uh, His name is Hay. Know anything about him? Yes, yes, a great deal. Uh, We received a letter from the Sheriff, too. They had to sell quite a large quantity of war bonds to him some time ago. He had a note here for about $20. He paid that off when he got the money from the bonds and opened a savings account. According to our records, he left about $100 in that account and left for California. You hear anything more about him after that? Yes, yes. We got several telegrams about his account and finally transferred his balance of eighty-seven seventy-nine to Ogden. Uh, where do your records show Hay lived while he was here? Well, the address he gave us was 1368 Perry Street. Uh-huh. I think I'll run over there and see what the landlady might know. <laughs> Are you Mrs. Forrest? Uh, yes. 
Uh, I'm looking for information on a chap named Hay. Why, I haven't seen Mr. Hay since, uh, let me see. Must be the latter part of October. Uh, what sort of fellow was he? Well, he was a quiet sort of boy. Uh, Englishman, I believe. Had been a soldier during the war. He was a printer, he told me. How long did he live here? Mm, he moved in uh, about the 1st of July, I believe. Uh-huh. He lived alone in the front room there till sometime around the middle or last part of September. He brought a Mr. Watts in with him one night and told me he'd be staying in his room for a while. Did uh, Watts pay any of the room rent? No. I got the impression that this Watts boy was broke. I let him stay here, and Mr. Hay paid the extra rent himself. And uh, when did you say he left? Just about the last of October. He left in a car with this man, Watts. Uh, uh, Kalamazoo Apartment. Captain Fox there. Uh, uh, just a minute. Uh, it's for you. Me? Well, thanks. Fox speaking. Fox, this is Bidan. People stay back. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. 7th and Olive Street in that city. That's so. Well, I'm glad to get that. I'll shoot that dope over to Sheriff Shea. Uh, thanks for calling. Look, Emmett, I've got an idea about this case. If he wired it all to that Detroit bank, he would have done it from close by the bank. Let's go in here and check with this telegraph office. Okay, well, lady, we're police officers. We're trying to check a telegram we think might have been sent from here on November the 29th of last year. Will you see if you've got a record of it? Surely. Uh, 26, 27, 8, November 29th. Uh, now, to whom was the telegram sent? People State Bank, Detroit, Michigan. Sent by a fellow named Hay. Mm-hmm. Here we are. Mm-hmm. Transfer all funds, account Wilfred Hay. Bank of Italy, 7th and Olive, Los Angeles. Thanks, miss. That helps a lot. Let's see now. You said that name was Hay, didn't you? That's right. Well, our records show that on December 1st, one of our customers introduced a Mr. Hay who opened an account by transferring some funds from a bank in Detroit. That's the one. How much money was there? About $1,100. After all, charges have been deducted. So what address did he give? 1201, Leighton Way. When was he in here last? Uh, Hay, I mean. Uh, I don't know. Made a $900 withdrawal on December 8th. Is that the last transaction on that account? Uh, let me see. Uh, no, there's a check paid on the 12th. Shows the date of December 9th. It's endorsed by a man at Carruthers. No other here. Well, that would indicate that Hay was alive on December 9th, Emmett. Yes, and I don't believe it. Neither do I. That body had been out there for at least a month when we found it. Who was this customer who introduced Hay to you? A man by the name of Watts. R.W. Watts. Same address as Hay. Watts, eh? What did this Watts fellow look like? About five feet nine or ten inches tall. Weighed, I guess, around 160, 165 pounds. Smooth shaven. Straight black hair. Sort of round face. Rather athletic build. Hmm. Well, I think I'll go over to that Leighton Street address. But the sheriff's check on the Leighton address netted only the information that a man by the name of Watts had lived there, but had left sometime in December. At the Los Angeles post office, Shea found a change of address directing that mail addressed to the Leighton Way house be forwarded to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. But the sheriff reasoned that this address was a blind and proceeded on the theory that the check forwarded from Carruthers indicated the true trail of the fugitive. Laid plans for his capture. Emmett. Yes? Send that stenographer in here, will you? Right away. Some dictation, Sheriff? Yes. First, ask Emmett to swear out of a murder complaint charging J.H. Watts with the murder of Wilfred Hay. Send a wire to the chief of police in Boston. Right. Ask him to check upon the address we got on Watts. Mm-hmm. Have the Lancaster, Pennsylvania police investigate him there. Okay. And ask them to watch the post office. Anything else? Yes, get a wire off to the motor vehicle department. Ask them to check up on that Overland through the out-of-state registration. You better get a letter off to Sheriff Jones up in Fresno, too. Ask him to find out from that fellow Thomas at Carruthers... About that check he cashed for Hay. Mm-hmm. Get him to have Thomas describe the man. Really making a search for this fellow, aren't you, Sheriff? Mm. I have a flock of bulletins printed, giving a complete description of Watts. Send them out to all the places up and down the coast. Right. With an especial supply to San Francisco and the Bay District. What else? Well, I guess that ought to keep him busy for a while. Mm-hmm. 
Within a few days, word came from San Francisco that a man answering Watt's description had cashed a check at a restaurant, giving the name of Kreger. San Francisco officers took up the hunt in earnest. Detective Sergeants Kalmbach and Richards, on a chance stakeout, were making the rounds of the branch post offices as well as the main San Francisco office. One day, late in February, they were scanning the faces of patrons at the general delivery window when... Anything for Jim or James Kreger? How do you spell it? C-R-E-G-G-E-R. James Kreger. Mm. Here's one letter. Thanks. All right, Kreger. You're under arrest. Says who? We do. Police officer to you. Hey, what's the idea? A little item of murder, San Bernardino. You're making a big mistake, mister. I haven't ever been in San Bernardino. Well, maybe not. We think you're J.H. Watts. We think you have been in San Bernardino. Anyway, that's where you're going. Watts was returned to San Bernardino County, and legal machinery began to turn to bring him to trial. Although he admitted his name and that he knew Wilfred Hayes slightly, he stoutly maintained his innocence. On April 10th, he was brought to trial. District Attorney George Johnson presented a veritable parade of witnesses. Your name is Sellers? Yes, Clark Sellers. You're an expert in comparing handwriting? I am. I show you samples of handwriting of the defendant Watts and of the victim Wilfred Hay. I will ask you if you have examined them. I have. And what did you find? Well, the handwriting of the man Hay is the same as that found on the hotel register in Ogden and on the telegram sent from Ogden. It is in no way similar to that of Watts. Is the handwriting of Watts similar to that found on the check marked Exhibit B and cashed in Carruthers, California on December 9th? It is. This signature, on this check, signed in San Francisco, bearing the name Hay, and the endorsement Kreger, is it the signature of Wilfred Hay? No, it is not. It is identical with the handwriting of J.H. Watts. That's all. Mrs. Silloway? Mrs. Silloway, uh, you were employed by the Western Union Telegraph Company? Yes, at Olive and Seventh in Los Angeles. Do you recognize the defendant, Watts? Yes, sir. He is the man who sent the telegram to the Detroit Bank. Thank you. That's all. Dr. Levin? Dr. Levin, you made spectrographic and microscopic tests of sand taken from the scene where the body of Wilfred Hay was found? Yes, I did. And did you make similar analysis of sand taken from the clothing of the defendant Watts? I did. And were they similar? They were identical. Thank you. That's all. Mr. Herrod. Mr. Herrod, will you tell the court and jury just what happened in relation to the defendant now on trial... On the evening of November 24th last? Well, I was on my way to Las Vegas to look at some mining property I have up there. My car broke down on the road about 20 miles west of Vegas. I stopped off at Silver Lake. A friend of mine lives there, runs a garage. I took care of his garage for him that night. Did you see the defendant on that night? Yes, sir. That evening, he walked into the garage and said he was out of gasoline. And it stalled down the road a ways. I walked part of the way down the road with him. Did he have a companion in the car with him? Yes, sir. I saw a man in the car that answered the description the officers gave of this man, Hay. Did Watts say anything about this man? Well, he said, I'm riding with a dead one. Did he give any reason for this remark? No, sir. But you were sure that the defendant was in the company of a man who answered Hay's description on the night of November 24th and that this was at Silver Lake? Yes, sir, I am. Thank you. R.W. Watts. Mr. Watts, is the defendant J.H. Watts related to you? Yes, he's my brother. Did you at any time introduce your brother to any official of the Bank of Italy in Los Angeles? Yes. In December, my brother came to Los Angeles. He said he was driving his own car and wanted to cash some drafts on a bank back east. I introduced him to the bank, guaranteed his signature. What name did he use in opening this account? He used the name of Wilfred Hay. What reason did he give for using that name? He said he'd had some trouble back east, domestic trouble... Wanted to use another name. Mr. Watts, what is your address at this time? San Quentin Penitentiary. And what is the reason for you being there? I was convicted in Los Angeles of grand larceny in connection with my brother's bank account. Thank you, Mr. Watts. That is all. Sheriff Shea. You are Walter Shea, Sheriff of San Bernardino County? I am. Have you seen the body of the man identified as Wilfred Hay? I have. Upon what do you base your identification of this man? By a comparison of the handwriting on the sheet of memorandum paper found on the victim's body with specimens of his known writing. What other means? By a comparison of the victim's description as furnished by witnesses who knew him with that of the dead man. Then you can say positively that the man whose body was found in the desert near Langford's well was Wilfred Hay? I can. That is all? Thank you. That is the people's case.
jury find the defendant, J.H. Watts, guilty of murder in the first degree. Before we execute the sentence of the court, is there anything you'd like to say? Nah, get it over. Stand there. Rio Grande Cracked is not a special privileged gasoline. It is the specified choice of the officials of 30 leading cities and counties throughout California and is used exclusively to power their emergency cars. The very same Rio Grande cracked gasoline is available to every motorist in California. The same finer motor fuel that sped police cars and other public service equipment over 55 million miles of California highway through all the hardships and weather changes of a single year has won the loyalty and patronage of thousands of thinking motorists. I feel confident that Rio Grande cracked will win your approval too when you give it a trial. The same Rio Grande tank trucks you see pull into the garages of your police and fire department serve the red and white Rio Grande station in your neighborhood with the same Rio Grande cracked gasoline used to power emergency public service cars. That's why you too will begin getting police car performance for your car when you wheel in tomorrow morning and ask the friendly Rio Grande dealer for a tank full of Rio Grande cracked. The gasoline preferred by officials for emergency cars. The gasoline preferred by a great army of motorists for all emergencies. On October 15th, two years after his crime, and after review by the state's highest courts, Watts walked up the steps of the gallows at San Quentin, sent there by a wadded sheet of memorandum paper. Without an apparent qualm, he plunged through the trap, and the brutal murder of Wilfred Hay was avenged. Today, this case is referred to as an outstanding one covering the law of circumstantial evidence. San Bernardino Sheriff's Office calling all cars, attention all cars, to cancellation of broadcast 211 regarding a dead body in the desert. Suspect in this case was hanged at San Quentin. That's all, Rose and Quill. Narrator Frederick Lindsley bidding you good night for Rio Grande. And cards, but if I ever saw one. To say nothing of being an exhibitionist. Well, let's get him out of here. Get it off your chest. What's that? I said get it off your chest. Listen to me, young man. One thing this prison doesn't tolerate is insubordination. We have a bunch of pretty tough mugs in this place, but they stay in line or else. Or else what? Try getting out of line and you'll soon find out. Yeah, this joint ain't so tough. That remains to be seen. We're not tough if you are not. But just in case you decide to start something, let me remind you that discipline is our specialty. We're not interested in what you did before you came here. But while you're here, you do as we say. I'll give you a chance at it. We're not interested in chances or your opinion of our methods. You'll obey rules or suffer the consequences. Take him out, guard. Floyd, Mr. Warden. Send him in. In here, Floyd. Thanks, pal. I see we're getting rid of you today, Floyd. I'm getting out, if that's what you mean. I mean just what I said. We're getting rid of you. I hope you don't feel hurt, Warden. Good riddance of bad rubbish is the way I look at it. Make it double. I suppose I should ask what you're going to do now. I suppose you should, to which I would reply it's none of your business. All right, Floyd, have it your way. Remember, though, next time we'll be three up for you. You won't come back here. No? Nope. You'll go to Alcatraz. I can take it. 
Well, I was hoping you'd stay out of my sight. Thanks, Warden. I needed them kind words. <laughs> Yeah? And this time, you're in Alcatraz. That's what it says, don't it? So you are tough, eh? Yeah. And don't start the usual line about rules and regulations. I ain't interested in how you treat prisoners. I know how long I gotta stay here and what for. So save it. Okay, Floyd. You write your own ticket. Be a good boy and we'll get along. Try any rough stuff and we'll go to town. Yeah, so I've heard. Don't worry about me, Warden. I'll do as I please. I generally do. Yes, I've heard that too. But according to your record sheet, you haven't gotten by so well. I've made out. I'll be seeing you, Warden. Well, that's what I'm afraid of. What's your name, buddy? Bill Floyd. The movie actor? No. Okay, pal, don't get tough about it. I'm just making conversation. Well, save it. What are you doing? The deuce. I got six weeks to go. What for? Impersonation. What's that? I was playing, pretending I was an army officer. Why? Ah, oh, for the love of Mike, pipe down. Hey, you want to make some jack? Huh? I got a girl in Walla Walla. So what? She knows some right guys down in San Diego. Still, so what? I got to get her south, see? Yeah. Can you copy ten? Sure. The torch in our mob goes to the hot seat a week from Monday. Some of the boys is going to make a break for it. If we don't make it, you'll look up this dame in Walla Walla and see that she gets south. You won't lose nothing by it. Okay. Slip me your handle. You just go to the order court out on F Street and ask for Juanita. That'll find her. Well, Floyd, you didn't turn out so tough after all. From which you conclude I've learned a lesson. Uh, maybe. Maybe is right. Don't congratulate yourself, Warden. I'm just not interested in this joint. Lord, you're breaking my heart. Take it easy, Warden. I may be back. Uh, the Lord forbid. Calling all cars. Copyrighted program transcribed and dedicated to the prevention of crime. Calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 209. Regarding a kidnapping, suspect described as male, American, 6 feet 1 inch, weight 175 pounds. Is heavily armed and dangerous. That is all. Gordon. <laughs> For law enforcement authorities to be efficient and one jump ahead of the law breakers, 
It is essential that they be equipped with and make use of all the newest scientific equipment that is applicable to the discovery of crime, the identification of the criminal, and his arrest. Unless the public is willing to and does spend the money necessary in this division of law enforcement, it will result in handicapping essential police work. Not only that, but it will give the criminal an advantage over the authorities with shattering results to society. And now, the true story of the bad man. Delacothe, Missouri. Well, Floyd, you're pretty young to be in a place like this. Never mind the Horatio Alger stuff. Young men, we don't tolerate an attitude like yours in this institution. You will obey the rules of this reform school and conduct yourself in such a manner as will make your stay here as brief as possible. I got a year to do. All right, I'll do a year. That's enough. According to your commitment, you were found guilty of petty theft and impersonating an officer. You realize that you're starting the wrong way, don't you? Do I have to stay in here? Until I finish talking to you, yes. Well, make it snappy, then. I'm not interested in preaching. All right, guard. Take him out. Come on, Floyd. All right, stop shoving. Warden, we've got to do something about this Floyd kid. Yeah, what's he done now? Practically everything he shouldn't. This morning, he cracked another kid over the head with a plate. And threw a cup at the mess hall guard while the kids were having breakfast. What's his complaint this time? Oh, who knows? He wants to be a big shot. Unless he's getting all the attention, he starts a row. Personally, I'd recommend solitary. No, no, that's against my principles. Uh, principles are not. That bird's got it coming to him. Well, we get rid of him in two weeks, thank the Lord. Keep him in quarters till then. Federal Penitentiary, Leavenworth, Kansas, two years later. William Edward Floyd, age 21, served one year for petty theft and impersonation. Chillicothe, Missouri. Conduct bad. Tough guy, are you, Floyd? What do you think? I don't think so. Stick around. You'll do that. See, you've been impersonating a federal officer again. So what? So you'll be with us for three years. That's your story. Look, Floyd, we might as well understand each other now. I don't take smart talk from prisoners. Oh, you don't? No, I don't. You can make up your mind to behave yourself while you're here. We have certain rules. They're not particularly hard, but we insist upon them being obeyed. Now, you can do as you please. You can obey and get along with us, or you can follow the same course you've evidently been in the habit of doing. In that case, we have our own method of dealing with you. What method? Well, if you're interested, it's easy enough to find out. Maybe I will, Warden. Captain to you, Floyd. Okay, Captain. <laughs> This is the third week in solitary for Floyd, Captain. Is he ready to be good? Well, that's a question. Personally, I don't think he ever will be what we call good. Well, how much longer has he got to go? Six months. I'll make out a transfer on him. Send him to McNeil Island. I'm tired of having him around here. That boy 